Will Travers, you are the president of the Born Free Foundation in the UK. That's right. Tell us about uh, Born Free. Well, yes, uh, briefly, uh, my mother and father were the actor and actress in the film Born Free in the way, way back in the 1960s. Um, and being in that film and working with Lyons and working with Joy and George Adamson, the, the real characters from the story of Elsa the Lioness, um, changed their lives. And then some years later, 1984, uh, we actually set up the charity together. I'm one of the founders. Um, and here we are 31 years later. It's going strong. We have a Born Free USA, we have Born Free in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in South Africa, in various different countries. And our agenda is kind of two things. The first is uh, wild animal welfare, and that can be everything. That can be from animals in the wild, so anti-poaching and, and the welfare associated with that, through to rescuing animals from very bad captive circumstances, zoos, circuses, as held as private pets. Uh, and also uh, conservation in the field, um, and part of conservation is looking at wildlife trade issues. You have uh, attended many CITES meetings, conferences, uh, and this was also something you focused on during your presentation at the seminar last night. Um, during your presentation, you expressed the view that CITES, in, during its conference next year in South Africa, was unlikely to look favorably on a proposal that suggests that trade in rhino horn should be legalized. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, explain that and expand on that? Certainly. I, I, I'm going to use the example of what happened with elephants and to illustrate this. Uh, CITES mistakenly, in my view, approved a significant sale of stockpiled ivory in 2008 and 2009 uh, to China and Japan. Um, the rationale behind that sale, which involved more than 100 tons of ivory, was that it would uh, meet demand, satisfy demand, and therefore reduce poaching pressure. Um, it actually had entirely the opposite effect, and poaching pressure has increased, not just steadily, but exponentially since that time, and we're now losing up to 30,000 elephants a year across Africa, and in some countries, 1,000 elephants a month. And I don't want to see the same risk being taken with rhino. And I think it's not just myself that doesn't want to see that. I suspect very strongly that the parties to CITES, the 181 parties to CITES, will not deliver the 66% approval that is needed, 66% or more, that's needed for a proposal to pass. And, and, and I, I've, I've been to so many CITES conferences my first one was in 1989. This will be my 11th next year, and they're only every two or three years. Um, I really don't find any joy at all in seeing the host nation um, potentially embarrassed by a situation like that. I think the host should come out of a conference feeling very positive, having uh, taken a leadership role, a convening role, and also having achieved something. And I think they will not achieve it with Rhino, and that would be a shame. Uh what about the risk of poaching increasing with the status quo? Well, hopefully we're not going to just sit on the status quo. Um, there are a number of global initiatives uh, looking at what can be done, and not just looking at it, but actually doing things. That The London summit that took place in, in London last year in 2014, the Kasane meeting that I attended in Botswana only about a month ago, um, the follow-up meeting that will take place in Vietnam, in 2016, ahead of the uh, Conference of the Parties. Yes, the, the, there have been numerous conferences and numerous declarations. Uh, poaching is going up. It's increased during the four months uh, up to April this year compared to the same period last year. So conference after conference produces declarations, uh, but it doesn't seem to impact on the growing poaching activities on the increased number of uh, carcasses that are found uh, without horns. Um, do you believe that the conferences uh, will in any way uh, assist, and, uh, and how have they assisted? Well, firstly, I think that the conferences put 
wildlife crime more firmly on the political agenda and that has to be important because up until very recently it's been rather marginalised. It is in fact, as I think many people are aware, with the fourth largest illegal activity in the world. Um, but it hasn't received the kind of attention that the fourth biggest illegal activity in the world deserves. So that's important. Political will is massively important. Secondly, um, the situation in South Africa, I completely understand. It's, it's really, really uh, serious, very, very desperate. And I know that the government is trying many, many measures. I don't think that they would make the situation better if they went down the pro-trade route. I think there are certain things that, for example, are happening in Kenya where the level of rhino poaching actually fell by 40% between 2013 and 2014. This year, so far in 2015, I believe they've lost three rhino. Now, you can extrapolate the numbers up. You know, if the 20,000 rhino in South Africa at a loss rate of uh, three rhino, there should be uh, three to 60. It would be the same as losing 60 here, and as you, you know, we've lost 400 or more. Um, so maybe there are things that could be learned by collaborating together, by working together, and it's up to the range states to do that. Um, also, the donor community um, are providing additional resources and support. I, when I went to the Kasane meeting, I was extremely impressed with, for example, the work of the Netherlands government offering uh, the training for 600 uh, rangers to go through forensic training. You, in your uh, presentation, also uh, express the view that we can end the scourge of poaching. Uh, what did you have in mind? Well, in my view, I, let me be clear, I don't think we can end poaching. I think poaching will happen at some level, but what we need to end is the epidemic level of poaching. And uh, it's not that long ago that South Africa had almost negligible rhino poaching. 2007, 13 rhino poached. So um, we need to try and find ways of returning to those days. It's going to require, as is happening already, uh, increased enforcement effort in the field. It's going to require long-term consumer re-education in consumer countries, and that is a long-term process. We, we can't just do that. We have to do the short-term stuff as well. But we also have to look at the involvement of criminal networks. And there are very sophisticated uh, um, activities that can be undertaken by some of the world's more sophisticated uh, intelligence gathering and law enforcement networks, um, I'm thinking Interpol, I'm thinking the US, I'm thinking the UK and others, together with South Africa, to not to just disrupt these networks, but dismantle the networks. Networks operate not just on wildlife. They are opportunistic. They go where they can make the profit. Now, I'm, they will take money on arms, on drugs, on people trafficking, on money laundering, and on wildlife. This would require a full cooperation between law enforcement that are involved, including Vietnam, China, yes. Mozambique, South Africa. Do you see that happening in the short term, before the rhinos' uh, numbers are decrease? Well, we know that rhino numbers have probably already gone past the tipping point and are slowly already decreasing. Um, but w whether we can do this before they reach a critical point and I think that we can. It requires, as I said before, political will. I think the political will is now there. We have to turn the political will into a series of actions, and one of those key actions is going to be cooperation at the intelligence gathering and law enforcement level. One of the speakers, uh, Dr. J uh, John Hanks, uh, threw out a challenge to those present uh, with his statement that Costs are increasing to conserve and protect rhinos and wildlife generally. Where are the funds going to come from, both as far as state protected parks are concerned, as well as the private owners? Do you have a response to that? Well, uh, I don't think there's donor fatigue. I think that there is a need to direct resources, and I think that there are actually very significant amounts of money available. It goes back to this point about political will. All governments have a choice as to where they spend the tax dollar or the tax rand. If wildlife is a super low priority, they will not put the resources there. But if wildlife is a higher priority, because it's associated with destabilization, with armed insurgents acting in certain areas, with organized criminality, then resources will flow. And I only point to the fact that the UK government is, I think, the only government in the world, actually, 
that has uh, met the 0.7% of GDP target set by the United Nations in terms of its overseas development budget. That means 12.2 billion pounds a year is available for aid. We have to use that aid more constructively, more creatively. And wildlife crime associated with poverty relief and alternative livelihoods could be a, a very important factor in that. Poaching is increasing. More rhinos are being killed and communities living around the protected areas increasingly are saying uh, we need to be part of it. We need to benefit from uh, the rights that we have in protected areas. Uh, do you believe that donors, donor countries or governments will be able to meet those challenges? Well, I hope they'll play a part in that. It, it, inevitably, it has to come down to national level. It either has to be in South Africa or it has to be in Mozambique and the two governments or the two governments cooperating, collaborating, where there is a common interest. I think the international community can play a role, but it does come down to national priorities. So I'm hoping that this will become a higher national priority, not least because of the uh, meetings and presentations that have taken place uh, here in Cape Town over the last few days and continue. I think that that is uh, it's played a very important part in raising the level of debate and dialogue. Developing countries in Africa and elsewhere have uh, a range of pressing priorities that they have to address in comparison with the developed countries. Uh, there are many suggestions that the issue of wildlife protection, the issue of the rhino, are of greater concern to the middle classes in the developed world than they are to the citizens of the countries in which the rhinos find themselves. Uh, do you regard it as a, a valid statement? And uh, if you do, uh, is that something which one needs to take into account when assessing a government's response or a government's attitude towards this? Well, I think governments need to obviously consider the views of their citizens, but actually in my experience, with all the African countries that I visited and that I work with, and I, they number in the, in the dozens, I have not found that uh, either the people or the agencies involved in wildlife protection don't consider these issues a priority. Um, if you go to Kenya and you go to some of the most remote parts of Kenya in the north, where people live in very similar uh, degrees of, uh, of poverty, not extreme poverty, but very, very subsistence levels of survival. Um, those people are not antagonistic to wildlife. They see it as a potential opportunity. And remember, there's no trophy hunting and there's no wildlife trade of any significance coming out of Kenya. They see wildlife as an opportunity and an opportunity that they want to be part of. They may need technical help, financial help, to begin those small or medium, ent uh, medium enterprises. But... Uh, I have not seen um, people marginalizing the importance of wildlife and more importantly wildlife as part of an ecosystem which supplies ecosystem services to many of those people. They see it as a top priority in fact. Thank you very much. Thank you.